Hey, how are you doing? My name's Elton and welcome to How Much Kubernetes Do I Need to Learn here at Dockercom. I've been using and teaching Kubernetes for many years and it's a complex platform with a steep learning path. But getting started with Kubernetes is pretty easy if you've got the right guide and this session is going to be your guide. You're about to learn the key concepts in Kubernetes and you'll find out where to go to learn more. So Kubernetes is a platform for running containers. And it's become the most popular container platform because you can run Kubernetes in any cloud and in the data center and on your laptop, and it's the same Kubernetes everywhere. So with Kubernetes, you have a standard way of defining and running your containerized applications. Now there are two core concepts in Kubernetes. The first is this idea of the cluster. So a cluster is just a whole bunch of servers. And Kubernetes, like Docker, is a multi-platform system, so you can have a mixture of Linux and Windows servers, and you can have a mixture of Intel and ARM processors. Now all of those servers need to have a container runtime installed, which could be Docker or Container D, and then you join all those servers together to become a Kubernetes cluster. And from this point, unless you're an administrator, you don't need to worry about those servers anymore. You'll talk to your Kubernetes cluster as a single unit and ask it to run your applications for you. And the way you do that is the second big concept in Kubernetes, which is the API. So Kubernetes has this really well-structured modeling language for you to describe your application. And you'll do that using YAML. And then when you're ready to deploy your application, you'll send all your YAML files up to the cluster and Kubernetes will work out which service to run those containers. And it will take care of making sure your application's always running. Now in that Kubernetes API, there are lots of abstractions for you to model your application. The containers are the compute abstraction. You specify which components your application needs to run, but there's also a networking abstraction. So you can model out which containers need to talk to each other, and you can also model taking external traffic from the cluster and sending it to your application containers. And as well as compute and networking abstractions, Kubernetes also has storage abstractions. So you can store the configuration for your applications inside the cluster, and there are different ways of storing non-sensitive and sensitive data, and you can also surface external storage for your applications. And this is why Kubernetes gets so complicated, because it lets you model your entire application, including infrastructure level concerns like networking and storage. But once you've modeled your application with Kubernetes, the API is standard. So you can run your application on any Kubernetes cluster and it will work in exactly the same way. So in this session, we'll dive into the three main types of object that you'll work with in the Kubernetes API, pods, services, and deployments. And if you're completely new to Kubernetes, this diagram may look complicated now, but by the end of the session, you'll understand how all those pieces fit together. So the first concept is the pod. And pods are how Kubernetes runs containers. So Kubernetes isn't a container runtime itself. It works with the container runtime that's installed on the servers to start and stop containers. And the Kubernetes object that takes care of that is the pod. So you're going to have a Docker image for each different component of your application, and you'll model each of those components in pods. To do that, you'll write some YAML, and pod specifications can be really simple. They'll start with some metadata, which all of the Kubernetes objects have. And you see in those fields there, I'm telling Kubernetes that this piece of YAML is going to describe a pod object using the version 1 API, and the pod is going to be called Who Am I? So that's the metadata that you'll see in all Kubernetes YAML for all types of objects. And then for this specific object, I'll have my spec, where I'm describing the containers that I want to run inside my pod. And in this case, I've got one container, it's going to be called app, and it's going to run from the image 6 i slash who am I. And that's a standard Docker image, it's publicly available on Docker Hub, and my Kubernetes cluster is going to be able to pull that image down and start my application in a container and wrap it inside a pod. And most of this session is going to be demos, so we're going to jump right in now and have a look at how these pods actually work. All of my demos are up on GitHub, so if you want to follow along, you can just clone the repo and try this out for yourself. The easiest way to get started is with Docker Desktop, which you can run on Windows 10 or Mac. And when you start Docker Desktop, if you open the settings, go down to Kubernetes and tick this box here that says Enable Kubernetes, Docker Desktop will take care of installing and setting up a Kubernetes cluster for you, which you can use as your development environment. Now I've already got that running, so I'll open up my demo documentation here, and this is what you'll find from the repo in GitHub. There's a markdown file for each of the demos, and all of the Kubernetes specs are inside this repo as well. So I'll close my browser down. And the first thing we'll do is run a really simple pod. So this specification here is pretty much exactly the same as the one we've just looked at. I'm describing a pod inside this YAML here. The pod will be called Who Am I? And inside the pod, there's a single container which will run from my Who Am I image up on Docker Hub. So if I close this down and open my terminal, the way you talk to your Kubernetes cluster is with the kubectl command line, which Docker Desktop installs for you. And the way you send it some YAML is with this apply command. So I'm going to run kubectl apply with the path for that YAML file that we've just looked at. And Kubernetes tells me it's created my pod. 
and I can look at the information for that pod. It will tell me there's one pod in the cluster and it's already up and running. And if I want to get some more detail, I can describe the pod. So all of these kubectl commands, get and describe, they work for all of the Kubernetes objects. The output will be slightly different depending on the object you're working with, but the syntax for the commands is always the same. When you run the describe command, you get a human readable output. And that tells me things like the container image that I'm running and the specific image ID. So that container is up and running. So it's kind of like the equivalent of me doing a docker run command, but Kubernetes is doing that for me. And it adds this layer around all of my containers. So if I want to get the container logs out, I can run kubectl logs. And that's the application logs that are coming out from my container. And if I wanted to connect to that pod and run some commands inside the container, I could do that too, except that this particular container image doesn't have a shell installed, so I can't do that. So what I'll do is I'll close my browser down and run another pod. This specification here, another really simple pod spec. The only difference is the name of the pod and the image that it's running, which in this case is an image that doesn't do anything at all. It just sits and sleeps, but it's got a shell installed so I can connect to the container when I run this pod. So I deploy this pod in the same way with kubectl apply. It creates my pod. And now if I list all the pods in my cluster, I've got my original who am I pod and my new sleep pod. Because my container image for my new pod has a shell installed, I can run commands with kubectl exec. So this is telling Kubernetes to run a command interactively inside my sleep pod and the command it's gonna run first of all is hostname. So it's just gonna print out the system's hostname as far as the pod container sees it. And what I get there is actually my pod name. And if I run who am I, this will tell me the user inside the pod container, which is the root user, which is how my Docker image is configured. Now you can run any type of application in Kubernetes. If you've got a really old monolithic application, you can package that up in an image and run it in Kubernetes and it'll work just fine. But typically you'll be running distributed applications with lots of components. And so you're gonna want your containers to be able to talk to each other. Now every pod in Kubernetes gets an IP address. So if I run get pods, with the wide parameter, that shows me that same information about the pods, but it also includes the IP address that each pod has. So my original Who Am I pod has the IP address 10.1.0.43. And if I want to communicate between my pods, I can use the IP address. So I can run a kubectl exec command here from my sleep pod, and that's going to run a curl command to talk to my Who Am I pod, which is a really simple HTTP server that will return a response. So when I run this, this is the output that I'm getting from calling my who are my application container and my pods can communicate with each other using the pod IP address. So pods are the first concept you need to understand in Kubernetes. They're how you run your containers, they're how you run your application components and Kubernetes constructs the environment for the pod. So it sets up the machine name and the machine IP address and it takes care of running your application container within that environment. So pods are the basic unit of compute inside Kubernetes. And if you have a distributed application, you're gonna have multiple pods running and we've seen that you can communicate with IP addresses, but that's problematic because the IP address is only constant for the life of the pod. And in Kubernetes, you'll be replacing your pods frequently. Anytime you've got an application update or an update to one of your libraries or to one of the base operating system images, you'll be deploying a new pod. That new pod will have a new IP address. So when the previous pod tries to connect using the old IP address, it's not gonna work. And that's where the networking abstraction comes in. So although pods can connect directly with their IP addresses, they're not going to. They're going to use a service instead. So a service is a separate Kubernetes object that you define in its own YAML file. And what the service does is it provides a static IP address that gets routed to a pod. So when my components need to connect to each other, they'll send their request to the service IP address and the service will route to the pod. So when pods get replaced, the service stays the same and it carries on routing traffic to the new pods. Now there are several types of service in Kubernetes, which you can use for internal communication between components like this, but you can also use services to take traffic from outside of your cluster and to route it into your application containers. Those are both service objects and they're both defined using YAML, but with slightly different parameters. So now in our application, we're gonna have one YAML for our pod and one YAML for our service. And services and pods are loosely coupled. So in your service spec, you don't list all the pods that you want to use. Instead, in your pod specification, you include a label, which is just an arbitrary key value pair. And then in your service, you tell it to identify the pods by using a label selector. So in this case, my service can route traffic to any pod that has the label app equals who am I. And that's what gives you the flexibility to replace your pods as part of an upgrade or to scale out and have multiple pods sitting behind one service. So inside the YAML here for my pod object, I'm gonna add some more metadata, which is the label. And I'll have a separate YAML specification for my service. It's gonna start in the same way. The kind this time is the service. The metadata is the service name. And inside the spec for the service, you include the ports that it listens on, but most importantly, you have this selector, which is how the service identifies the pods that it's gonna route traffic to. 
So really the service is just a routing component. Kubernetes runs a DNS server. So when pods need to communicate, they'll use the service name as the DNS name that they want to connect to, and Kubernetes will return with the service IP address. And when any traffic comes into that service, it'll get routed to a pod with a matching label. Okay, so let's go and see how that works. So I've already got some pods running from my last demo, but they don't have any labels, so they're not suitable for using with the service. So what I'll do is I'll delete those pods, and I'll deploy some new pod specifications that include labels. And while that's starting up, we'll have a look at those specs. So my Who Am I spec is the same as before. It uses the same container image, but now inside the metadata, there's a label, and it's a convention to use the application name inside the label. So I'm saying this is my Who Am I app. And for my sleep pod, again, it's the same container image that I was using before, and now I have a label in here to identify this as my sleep application. Okay, so those will be running now. I can list out all the pods with kubectl get pods, but if I include the wide flag, that will show me some extra detail like the IP addresses. And if I include the show labels flag, that will show me all of the object labels. So here are my two pods, my sleep pod, my who am I pod. I can see the IP address of each pod and the labels that are applied there. Now, if I want to communicate from my sleep pod to my who am I pod without having to use the pod IP address, then I need to deploy my service. So I have a service defined here. So inside this service spec, I have my selector, which will match any pods that have the label app equals who am I. And this service will be listening on port 80 and it will send traffic into the container on port 80. So you can do port mapping here just like you can with Docker. And this service type here, this is what tells Kubernetes this is an internal service. So cluster IP means I'm gonna get an IP address, which is only useful within the cluster. And this is how you define your networking for pods to talk to each other. So let's close this down and deploy my service. And it doesn't matter what's inside your YAML, whether it's a pod or a service, you always send it to the cluster in the same way with kubectl apply. That's gonna create my service. And again, I can use those familiar commands. So kubectl describe will give me some information about the service. So that includes the selector that's gonna identify the pods, the IP address of the service itself, and the endpoints of the pod IP addresses. So these are the pods that are gonna get routed to. And we can see this endpoint here, 10.1.0.46. That's my who am I pod. So the service has found that pod and it's gonna route any request to that pod. So if I scroll down here, we can see that in action. So I'll run a command inside my sleep container and NS lookup is a DNS lookup that will run inside the pod. So I'm asking it to look up the server called who am I. You can ignore all those errors. The important thing here is that I get an address back, which is my service IP address. And so now when I run a curl command inside my sleep pod container, I can use the DNS name of the service and I get my response back. So the details in the response here to tell me the host name of the container, which is my who am I container and its IP address. And that's a different IP address from the service because the service acts as a load balancer and it's routed the traffic to my pod. So that's all working internally, but if I want to be able to browse to my application from outside of the cluster to send in a request from my laptop to my who am I container, then I need a different type of service. So I have another YAML definition here and the description is very similar. I have the same selector here to find the who am I app. This time I'm listening on port 8080 and I'm sending traffic into the container on port 80, but this service is a load balancer type. Now load balancer services take external traffic from outside of the cluster and route it into my application container. So in this case, I'll be able to send traffic to my Docker desktop machine on port 8080 and it will route the request into my pod container on port 80. So if I close this down and open my terminal again, I'll deploy my new service, which is my load balancer type. Now, if I look at all of my services, I'll see my Who Am I app has got two services. There's my cluster IP service for internal access between my components, and my load balancer service is publishing to local hosts, so I can access that externally from the cluster. So if I do that here, if I run a curl command on my machine, looking at local host port 8080, the Kubernetes cluster, which is running in Docker desktop, receives that external request, routes it to my pod container, and I get my response back out. So you can think of services as a software router. The service has its own DNS name and its own IP address, and it has a label selector to identify the pods that it's gonna route traffic to. And any number of pods can have that matching label, and the service will load balance requests between those pods. And you can create pods manually, but pods have to have a unique name. So if I wanted to scale up my Who Am I application, I would need another YAML specification for another pod with a different name, and then I could deploy that and my service would load balance between my two pods but having a separate YAML file for every pod and having to work out the names yourself isn't a very scalable approach. And Kubernetes has another object for that. And inside that object, you specify a pod template. So the object knows how to create multiple copies of the same pod specification. And that's how you can scale up and down. That object's called a deployment. And it's the last thing we'll cover in this session. And deployments use that same label selector mechanism to identify the pods that they own. So now the spec for my application will be slightly different. 
I'll still have two YAML files, but for my compute layer, I won't be specifying a pod, I'll be specifying a deployment object. And inside the spec for that deployment object, I include a selector, so the deployment can find out which pods are running inside Kubernetes, and it knows which ones it owns by its label. And it will also have a pod specification. So the specification for your pod, instead of living in its own YAML file, moves inside the deployment object. So the deployment object has a template, and it can use that to create new pods. And then I'll have another YAML file for my service, and typically the selector inside the service will be exactly the same as the selector in my deployment object because they both have the same loosely coupled relationship to the pods. Now there's two reasons why you use a deployment instead of a pod directly. The first one is scale. So I can run multiple copies of my application to give me high availability and increased load. And however many replicas there are, the service will span across all of them. So scaling up and down is as easy as changing my deployment definition to add more pods or fewer pods and the service will make sure it only sends traffic to pods that are up and running and healthy. And the second reason to use deployments is that they take care of doing rolling upgrades for you. So when I've got a new version of my app to roll out, I'll change my deployment specification, and it will start by creating a new pod from my new pod specification, which could be a new image version. And as soon as that pod's up and running and healthy, it gets enlisted into the service too. And then the deployment will take down one of the old pods. And this is a rolling process, so next it will start another version 2 pod. When that's up and running and healthy and the service is sending traffic to that pod, the deployment will get rid of the old version 1 pod. So you get this graceful update procedure that's fully automated, and if there's a problem with the rollout, then Kubernetes can take care of it for you. Okay, so let's see how that works. So in this demo, what I'll do is I'll get rid of my previous Who Am I pod that I deployed directly, and instead I'll create a new version using a deployment. So the YAML's getting a bit more complicated here, this is a deployment object with its own name, which is who am I. Inside the deployment spec, there's that label selector, so it can find the pods that it owns. And there's a template for the pod spec. So that's the application label inside the pod. And I have that same container definition using my same Docker Hub image. So when I deploy this, that's gonna create me a single pod. And when I'm working with objects in kubectl, I can use the same label selector approach to find just pods that match that label. So this will find me my who am I pod. I've got a single pod running with a random name that the deployment object has created for me. And that's got the IP address 10.1.0.47. So deployments are their own objects, so I can work with deployments with kubectl directly. This tells me how many pods it's expecting to have and how many are ready to work. And although I've got a completely new pod now with a new IP address, it uses the same labels as before, so my service will work in the same way. So if I make a request to my local host, I haven't had to change any of my services because of the loose coupling between services and pods. And now I get a response from my new pod with the random name and the IP address from the pod that the deployment created. Now, any changes that I want to make to my application will be done with changes to my YAML file. So if I have a new version of my application to update, or if I want to increase the number of replicas to get more scale, there will be a change to my YAML and a new kubectl apply command that Kubernetes will affect across my cluster. So in my version two YAML file here, it's the same deployment object, so I'm using the same name, so Kubernetes will see this as an update to my existing deployment. I'm adding more replicas, so I'll have five pods here that the deployment's going to manage. And I've changed my pod specification to, to include an environment variable which changes the configuration of the app. So when I send this to Kubernetes, it will see that it needs to change my deployment object to run multiple replicas, and those replicas are going to need to run from a different pod specification. So I'm going to open my terminal here, and clear things down, I'm going to run two terminals. So in the first one, I'm going to look at all the pods that have my who am I label, and I'm going to use the watch flag, which means the kubectl command will sit there and watch for any changes to my pod. So I can see that I've got one pod that's up and running. And when I go ahead and deploy my new change now, we'll see a whole bunch of things happen. And if we look at those events, we'll see there's pods in the container creating status, which is my new pods being created. There are events showing me the running status and the terminating status. So what's happened is my deployment has started by scaling up the old pods to get the new replica definition, and then it's replaced those with my new pod specification. So if I close this terminal and clear this down, now when I look at my pods, I've got five pods which are running. Each pod's got a different IP address and a different name, but they're all using the same specification. And if I make a request to my local host, we'll see I get a different response back because that's what the configuration flag inside my update does. It changes to, to send back a smaller response. And if I repeat my command, we'll see I get responses from different pods each time. So there you've seen the deployment in action, doing a rolling update of my application to, to a new version, in this case, just a config change. And you've also seen the service in action as a load balancer, distributing traffic across multiple pods because I now have several pods that match the label selector for the service. So that's your 101 introduction to Kubernetes.
We've looked at the main objects that you'll work with with the Kubernetes API, that's pods, services, and deployments. And we've also seen the kubectl command, which is how you work with your Kubernetes cluster. Now, there are two other objects that we didn't cover in this session, which you're going to need to understand before you can do any serious modeling in Kubernetes, and they're config maps and secrets. And that's how you apply configuration into your applications so that you can use the same Docker image in all of your environments and apply the environment settings from Kubernetes objects that you load into the application containers. Now, I didn't have time to go into those details, but if you look at the GitHub repo for this session, you'll find there's another folder called Widgetario, which has all the Kubernetes specifications for a simple demo application that runs across multiple containers. And if you look through the YAML, you'll see there are deployments with pod specifications inside them. There are services for internal and external access. And there are also config maps and secrets. And if you want to look around that sample application, that will give you a really good feel for how things are defined with Kubernetes. And that's all for today's session. Thanks very much for joining me. And if you do want to check out those demo docs, you'll find them on GitHub with this short link here. If you're interested in learning more Kubernetes, then if you check out this link, that's all the practical exercises that I teach in my Kubernetes Fundamentals course, but they're all self-paced and you can follow along with them by yourself just using Docker Desktop. If you want a bit more guidance, then you can check out my video courses on Pluralsight. And if you prefer to learn Kubernetes with a book, then this link will take you to my bestseller, Learn Kubernetes in a Month of Lunches. And if you use that code, Stoneman PC, you'll get 40% off. So thanks again for joining. This is the seventh consecutive DockerCon where I presented and it's always my favorite conference. And hopefully next year we can meet in person. My name's Elton, thanks for watching. Hope to see you soon.